to the 30th meeting in 2017 of the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee. Could I please remind you all to make sure that your mobile phones are on silent? Uh, no apologies have been received, uh, and we're going to move straight to agenda item one on the Islands Bill, Scotland. This is the sixth session that, on, that we've taken evidence on on the Islands Bill. I'd like to welcome Aidan Smith, the Head of Planning and Development, Scottish Environment Link, and Cathy Tilbrook, Head of Coastal and Marine Ecosystem, Scottish Natural Heritage. Good morning. We, we have some questions for you. Uh, have, have you. Have you been to, have you given evidence at a committee before? Both of you. So you yes. know you don't need to touch the buttons. And if you, if you catch my eye, I will try and bring you in at, at the uh, right moment um, so you get a chance to answer all the uh, questions. First question is going to be from the Deputy Convener, uh, Gail Ross. Thank you, Convener. Good morning. Thank you for coming along. Um, <coughs> just overall, do you think that the intent of the bill is in line with expectations? Cathy, you nodded. That's always because so <laughs> that means Dangerous. you've got the answer. So, okay. Cathy, you first, and then Aidan, if I may. Uh, well, I think I'd, I'd first like to say that uh, SNH certainly supports the aspiration and intent of the bill uh, to help island communities achieve their aims for the future. Um, and I, I just wanted to also say that, um, from our perspective, we feel islands are, are such a, an important, distinctive part of Scotland's natural and cultural heritage. Um, and so it's very important that we, we make sure that we, we safeguard the assets that island communities depend on. Um, so we've, we feel that's a very important part of this bill, which maybe hasn't been uh, dwelled on too much yet. Um, I think there are aspects of the bill um, that could be clarified to better achieve the, the stated aims. And we touched on some of that in, in our written evidence. Um, and largely that, that relates to the marine licensing provisions. So I don't know if you want me to expand just now. No, but not have, at the moment, because um, we'll be definitely coming to that. We have some views on how that could perhaps be um, clarified to, to strengthen uh, the achieve achievement of the aims of the bill. Aidan, do you want to like? Uh, yeah, likewise, uh, agree with agree with Cathy there. Um, we welcome the bill as, as well. I think it's got a, a lot of potential to coordinate um, a, a range of issues in terms of uh, in terms of the islands. Um, but perhaps maybe a bit uh, surprising that uh, the natural heritage value of Scotland's islands hasn't explicitly recognised uh, within within the bill, given that that is kind of one of the really kind of key things which Scotland's islands are are particularly important for and well recognised for, both within the islands and 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 beyond. Uh, and then the other kind of high level thing, I guess, that perhaps we're, we're a bit surprised about is the real focus on populated islands, inhabited islands only. Uh, a lot of Scotland's island communities are kind of intrinsically connected with un uninhabited islands as well. So the, the focus on, on inhabited islands is maybe a, a bit surprising. We'd like to see it broadened out to include, include consideration of uninhabited islands as well. Okay. Cool. Um, do you feel that it will lead to, um, we'll go into the inhabited island side, I think we're going to touch on the, the uninhabited islands um, later on. Do you think that it will lead to greater empowerment of island communities? I certainly think it could do, yes, ab absolutely. Uh, it uh, gives uh, specific recognition of the, of the unique circumstances that there can be on island, island communities and in island places, if you like. So it's got potential to do that, certainly. Um, it's... Uh, I guess a lot of the detail will be will be where the, the real difference is made, though. Yeah, I think I, I would echo that and just say that I think some of our views are that, that there are um, quite a number of existing provisions, some of which haven't really yet bedded in, um, that would also help to achieve the aims of the bill in terms of marine planning, the Community Empowerment Act, and some of these other sort of tools that are there. Um, we're quite keen to just see how we make sure that this bill adds value to those and we, we make sure that they're properly integrated with those other provisions. Yeah. Good. Raida, did you want to come in on that? Or? Could I please? Um, really to um, Cathy, as much as <coughs> anything. Um, do you see powers that are held by SNH at the moment that could be devolved um, to islands? I mean, I quite often hear from islands that there are things that are, they feel are being done to them, especially environmentally, um, rather than with them and disregarding, I guess, the knowledge that they already have. Um, and some of those those actions have proved detrimental. Well, I'm, I'm disappointed to hear that, that, that feedback. And certainly we are very uh, keen to 
um, consider how we can better meet the sort of requirements of the Community Empowerment Act and work with communities to involve them much more in decisions about things like um, protected area management. So we're doing a lot of work on that at the moment. Um, and we are uh, looking at pilot studies to see how we can involve, for example, um, local authorities and local communities in, in the management of, of marine protected areas. Um, I think the feedback from uh, our recent uh, consultation uh, on marine protected areas uh, around Scotland was actually quite good, that we did make a real effort to, um, to talk to communities, to involve them, um, and certainly the feedback from, from a number of stakeholders was that that process had been much more effective in Scotland than it had south, south of the border. Um, but I know that there are issues, and obviously uh, we, we want to work to, to strengthen that relationship with local communities, so I'm very pleased to, you know, to try to do more on that. <coughs> Aidan. Yeah, just uh, on a kind of similar point, I guess, the, the, the thing is really that the, the, a lot of Scotland's uh, island communities are uh, custodians, if you like, of some of the best bits of Scotland's natural environment. There's absolutely no, no doubt about that at all. And there is a, a kind of obligation on um, um, island communities often to, to look after that in a way which uh, kind of benefits the people on the islands, but benefits people beyond that as well, because the, the significance of these areas sometimes is such that it's, it's, it's something which is of, of value to visitors and for people across Scotland and, and beyond. So there is a bit of a, a need for communities perhaps to be, um, be helped out a little bit perhaps and how they, how they can manage, manage those. But there certainly does need to be a, a, a certainty that there's going to be a, a minimum standard of protection for that natural environment and that local communities are given the assistance to, to help manage them in the way which, uh, which is required. Okay. Uh, they, they would argue that those um, things are in place because they have, in, through history, looked after them and it seems, uh, I think they take it a bit... Um, tough that people come in and tell them how how they should be doing what they have very obviously already been doing and then impose upon them what they see as nonsensical reg regulation. Is there a way that they could be used to, some of this could be devolved to them, that they identify those features, that they, through local knowledge, know how to, to look after them, that those designations could be handed down to islands? I, th I think we're looking at that, and we're looking at ways that that could be made to happen. But obviously, um, with designations, uh, particularly for, at the moment with the European level of designations, there are quite strict rules about how you go through the process of, um, you know, selection, and um, it, you know, there are quite a lot of technical um, issues involved. That's not to say that local communities with help couldn't be a major part of that process. It's just working out how best that could be that could be achieved. So we need to, I think, pilot that really and, and test it and see how how, how best we could. Um, manage to, to, to work side by side with communities more effectively. Aidan, do you like? Yep, absolutely agree with that. It's about really how can we enable and assist uh, island communities to continue a lot of the good work they've been doing. So perhaps a good example of that might be things like the, the Macher habitats on the, on the Western Isles and on the US, which have been managed with support from, uh, uh, from, from Scotland and the UK and from, from Europe. And, uh, and as we kind of move forward, if, uh, if the kind of, uh, Scotland's place in Europe kind of changes, we'll need to really think about how do we kind of keep that support going uh, so, and that'll be that'll be critical. It's a, it's, a, it's a really kind of famous habitat. It's, it's something which is valued both on the islands and, and beyond. And, and maintaining that thing and helping local island communities be able to maintain that in the future will be critical. Okay, I think we'll move on to the, the next section, John. That, that, that's you. Uh, thanks, convener. And uh, yeah, Mr. Smith, you've already raised an issue which I was going to ask you about. So I'll ask you about it anyway. Um, in the in the uh, clause section three, it talks about the National Islands Plan. It specifically says, uh, objectives and strategy of the Scottish ministers in relation to improving outcomes for island communities. So that suggests that the Islands Plan will totally ignore islands that aren't inhabited, like presumably St Kilda. Um, so what are your thoughts on that? And should we have you an alternative wording if we should change something in the bill in relation to that? 
Yeah, so, uh, so, so St Kilda is a good example, I think, where there's a, there are really uh, strong kind of cultural links to ex existing uh, inhabited islands, effectively. Uh, and it, it does, uh, we feel, uh, particularly given the, the, the nature of the, the, the interconnectedness of both cultural and, uh, and uh, natural heritage of the islands, it does kind of draw a bit of a, a, false, uh, a false boundary, if you like, around inhabited islands. So we would like to see that broadened out to, to cover all islands. I think that would be the simple way of doing it, would be for it to consider all islands. But, I mean, I suppose the, the slight danger uh, would be that, you know, communities then get undervalued if we just look at the islands. So if we said, for example, improving outcomes for islands uh, and drop the communities, that might be a bit of a problem. I mean, I'm not asking you necessarily to rewrite the bill right now, but I mean, if we said islands and island communities, would that be one answer? Or? Sure, I think it's just about um, not drawing t boundaries too tightly. So, uh, so St Kilda that you mentioned is a, is a great example where there is a, a, a long-standing kind of cultural and environmental connection uh, between uh, between the Western Isles and and and, and uh, as, as, a, as a, the main bit of the Western Isles, if you like, in St Kilda. And to draw an artificial boundary around inhabited uh, islands only seems to be um, against the, a bit against the spirit of the of what's trying to be achieved. Okay. Does, did you have a comment on that, Ms. Talbot? Uh, you... not, not really. I think, um, I, I think we felt that, that the uninhabited islands would probably be picked up geographically in terms of the plan by the kind of um, area sort of um, coverage of, of, of the National Islands plan, mm -hmm. but that the focus very much of this bill was much more on, on communities and the challenges that they face. Um, and I think we probably felt that uninhabited islands and, and the kind of um, requirements for those would be picked up more by, by general planning uh, sort of measures and, and things like the, uh, the marine plans, the regional marine plans as they come along. But um, I do take on board Aidan's uh, points there and it's something we'd be interested to, to look at further. Okay, well, if we widen it out now to the, the, the whole question of the plan, I mean, there's really nothing in the bill uh, about what should be in the plan. And that's a subject we've discussed quite a lot uh, on the islands as well as, as here in the committee. So, so would your feeling be that uh, maybe there should be? I mean, you've already mentioned kind of natural heritage and that's the kind of area that you are involved in. Another suggestion has been population, that we should specifically say in the bill that we want to raise or stabilise or halt the decline of population. So what's your feeling around that? Should we have more in the bill about the plan or do we just leave it to see what comes up in the plan? I'll, I'll go to Aidan first and then Cathy, because I think that's a logical way. Sorry, Aidan. Um, well, well, yeah, the, the plan is, would be the, log the logical place to address some of those issues. And I think if it, was, uh, if, if it was stated in the bill that the plan should specifically pick up those issues, that would be this, maybe one of the simpler ways of, of amending the bill to ensure that they were covered. So, um, so certainly we would be supportive of something which required the plan to specifically address natural heritage issues, for instance. So, mm -hmm. so that, that could be a, a way forward, I think. I mean, the kind of counter-argument, if I can just throw that in just now, uh, is if you put something in, then anything you don't put in might feel it was undervalued. So if we, if we say natural heritage, population, transport, health, education, you know, then maybe something else uh, might be feel undervalued. Do you think there's a risk of that or is that...? Um, possibly. Um, uh, so, uh, I, I mean, uh, the, the, I guess the way that we would hope that the, the, the plan would work it would be to act as a kind of coordinating mechanism across other areas of government policy making, which are, which are, which are already out there. So the primary thing, uh, the, the primary benefit, I suppose, it could bring is to coordinate that and, and make sure that there is a, a, a single place where these things are considered from, a, from an island's perspective. And then thinking back again to what's special about the islands of course it's, it's island communities but it's also the natural heritage and the cultural heritage of the islands as well and so for, for, for those potentially not to be addressed in a plan would seem to be a, a bit of a, a missed opportunity okay. uh, I'll to, to let you come in here and I'll maybe let okay. you have one more question well, I think that's or, me unless, uh, well uh, I'd quite like to come in then if, if that's right Cathy could you just yeah, well, I, I think our view would be that maybe the bill doesn't need to be that prescriptive about what is in the plan. Um, I think those kind of high-level uh, statements about coordinating and really focusing in on what is special and distinctive about the, the challenges of, of, of living on an island or uh, facing island communities, um, it's that kind of high-level um, steer, really, that needs to be in the bill, and then perhaps the, the detail will... Um, 
following the plan itself. But I would just come back to, you know, you talked about the sort of um, population issues and the sustainability of island communities. And I think, again, it would just be to stress that um, so many of those island communities are very dependent on their natural resources and the surrounding seas. And therefore, you know, for us, the sustainability of those island communities goes hand in hand with having a healthy environment. Okay. Yeah. Cathy, if I, John, uh, just if I may, I mean, having read SNH's submission, it, it was very much that there should be a strategic plan, and, and we've wrestled with the evidence that we've been hearing. Some of the islands with stronger communities believe that they should have their own plan, mm. and some people believe that islands with island groups are very different to the rest of the island group. Mm. And it appears that some would like their own plan and feel they should have their own plan for each and every island, uh, and, and some don't. Um, how, how's, how do you think, do you think the bill balances that and do you think s &H balance it by saying it should be strategic or do you think local people are going to feel marginalised? I, I think again the difficulty here is that we're not yet at the point with other systems like the, the marine planning system um, and community planning perhaps of getting down to that level of detail where local um, communities really feel they've got a valid input into planning for their local area. And I don't think this is the place to do that. I think this, um, the, the islands plan is very much about pulling out the issues that are common um, to the challenges of islands uh, in terms of service delivery, things like that, um, and planning for, you know, uh, you know the detail of, of, of sort of particular communities, particular islands, we, we should be using the planning, the existing planning process for that. And unfortunately, those systems are not yet well developed enough, I think, for people to see the benefits of those. So I think it will take time for those systems to, to bed down. Um, and then, you know, I see the islands bill as being something higher that, that sort of, um, uh, you know, feeds into those other, other, other strategic plans and sort of says, don't forget to focus on these issues um, across the board. Aidan, do you want to say something? Yep, I, I, I'd agree with that as well. So they, there are existing mechanisms under um, the, the Marine Act to produce uh, regional marine plans, and the, 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 the terrestrial land use planning system has got flexibility in terms of the area that's covered by development plans. And the land use strategy also has got potential to provide a bit of a, a hook for, uh, for thinking about wider land use as, as well. And I, I think those sort of three areas are, are perhaps better for setting a vision for, uh, for local places, whether that's a marine area or a terrestrial area, uh, then perhaps this is, which is more about the, the, the issues which are in common across, uh, across island groupings. Okay, we're going to move on to the next section. Mike, uh, that's you. <clears throat> yes, I'm going to focus on the issue of the shorthand we're calling island proofing, and my questions really are directed in this section to, to Cathy as representing SNH. SNH is number 28 in the public bodies that I mentioned in the bill. And the bill is saying that relevant authorities like SNH must have regard to island communities carrying out its functions and must prepare an island community impact assessment in relation to policy, strategy and service. <coughs> in your written evidence to us, you say SNH have a balancing duty already through the, the Natural Heritage 1991 Act requiring us to take account of the interests of local communities. Rather than an additional process, we would prefer to adapt our internal approach to this duty to meet any new requirements. So what you're saying to us in your written evidence is that actually you do this already. Is that right? Yeah, I, would, I would hope we do, and I think we need to really look at it carefully to see whether there are any aspects that would be tightened up. And I think a national islands plan would help with that in terms of highlighting the kind of issues that we need to mm -hmm. always remind ourselves of. Um, but I think what we were really saying there, and we would obviously still comply with the, the terms of the guidance in terms of how we report on that, how we you know, uh, make sure that we're monitoring properly what we're doing, but we, I think we just felt that it was more efficient to, you, to amend an existing process and just make sure we're, we're covering this new, uh, new duty, new requirement, rather than having another mm -hmm. parallel sort of okay, process. Well, my, my question runs very much from what you just said. In that case, how do you do it at the moment? How do you island-proof your policies and strategies and, and plans? Because the worry of the islanders that we have spoken to on the islands, various islands, is that um, they want to avoid public authorities sitting in Edinburgh or Glasgow, wherever mm. they are, to, to avoid a situation where you have a tick-box exercise mm. and that they feel consultation is extremely important. And I know in your written evidence you, you said also that... A, your systems, are, you want a system simple and quick to apply, including any consultation requirements. But that sort of implies that you're not sure whether that consultation is, is, is 
important, I, whereas that's not what we're getting I, back from the islanders. Sure. I think dialogue and communication is really important. I don't know whether there's going to be a requirement for formal consultation, um, and if there is, you know, certainly we, we, we would make sure we do that, but it's important to remember we've got, we've got locally based staff mm -hmm. um, in, in a lot of the island groups and they're in daily discussion with their local authority colleagues, with, with communities, um, and I think they are in a good position uh, and they, they do this um, to, to flag up if, if there's some sort of proposal for a new, new policy or a new plan that they think will be detrimental to their local patch they're immediately um, in touch to make sure that we, we amend that, but we need to make sure that that perhaps is, is a bit more, um, you know, uh, of a rigorous monitored mm. approach in order to meet the duty. But I would say we, we certainly are trying to do that already, and things like I referred to the MPA consultation earlier, um, part of our early uh, work on that was working out which locations we needed to go to, including most of those islands that, well, all the islands that were directly affected by the proposals to actually sit down and talk to people locally about those. And I think the key thing is um, having an early screening process so that you make sure you're focusing on the, the most relevant policies and plans, and then you're in a position to influence those before they get, uh, you know, too advanced, because I think... Um, there's a danger with all of these things that you leave it to the end and then you fill out the box to see if you've um, island proofed. It's too late by that point. You need to do it right from the early stage and make sure you've thought about you know, island issues or the issues of other remote mainland communities as well as you develop your, your proposal. Do you feel that the, the, I mean, what you're saying to us is that you, you, your system's good and that you, you feel that there's a proper consultation, you have a process. Do you think the islanders feel that? I mean, I know you're saying mm. you're talking to your staff on the islands yeah. or working on the islands, but that's within your mm. organisation. Are you sure that the, the people that are living on the islands mm. recognise that this is the process that you're going through? I think we probably need to do a bit more to check that that is the case, and, and I'm sure there's, there's things we can do to strengthen that process. So I'm not saying okay. that we've got a perfect process at the moment, but I think there are ways we can build on it rather than having to kind of come up with something completely brand new. Do you think there are any budgetary concerns regarding the requirements in the bill that you might be concerned about? What do you feel? I, I think for that one, it is just about allowing time and all of these issues to do with uh, making sure you're working with communities involve maybe a bit more time, but hopefully you end up with a better solution at the end of it. So I think it's time we, we, need, to, we need to spend. So I just wanted to clarify, you don't think whatever happens when, when it's island proofing or having a regard, you don't think there should be a prescriptive system for everybody because you feel SNH basically does it already and you don't want... Am I, I interpreting you correctly? I think guidance would be helpful. So guidance mm. about the kind of screening process, and then I think there is there is um, you know sort of some detail in the bill about the reporting. But um, I think it's not particularly clear who would make that judgment on whether you've island proofed effectively. Um, so again, you know, if there's going to be some, uh, it might be helpful to have some clarity on that. Who's policing it? Okay. Kathy, can I? Uh, sorry, my just a, a, a quick question. Um, and for the avoidance of doubt, I'm going to declare an interest. I don't think it's relevant, but I am part of a farming partnership. Um, and my question is, is, is the budgetary concern. Sometimes it costs more to do things on islands mm. uh, than it does on the mainland. And some of your grant schemes may have uh, financial implications if you are going to make them suitable for islands, which might require more money than the mainland. Mm. Is that a concern for SNH? Uh, to be honest, I don't know whether we have specifically looked at that aspect in terms of, um, of, of funding streams. I think we would probably just consider an application for funding um, that, that, you know, included those additional costs and, and, and take, take them on board, and that, that's valid. You know, um, I can't see that we would be discriminating on that basis. So, um, we, and as I say, we've got a lot of staff based on islands, and obviously we factor in the cost of, of, of travel, and uh, we're very aware of, of those additional additional costs of working and, and living on islands. So it's not something we're, we're, we're unaware of. OK, um, we'll move on to the next section, if I may, which will be John uh, Finney. And to, to give Cathy a break, because that was fairly <laughs> intensive for her, uh, sort of warning Aidan now that you'll be the first <coughs> one up to answer this. So, John. Uh, thank you, Kavina. Good morning, panel. So a question about marine development. The bill introduces um, regulation-making power in respect of that. Do you agree with these powers? And how do you think they could be used? 
so, so yes, agree with them in, in principle. Uh, I guess uh, the, uh, the the only concern possibly is uh, whether it would result in additional effort being required, and additional resources being required in terms of their uh, in terms of the way that they're managed. So, good to introduce um, uh, potentially a, a kind of clear ability for for island uh, communities to get involved. But it's not entirely clear how that would relate to existing powers under marine licensing uh, and how uh, how the, the the two systems would work together without causing duplication of effort from uh, consultees and so on. So, so there's a bit more detail maybe needs to, to, to come out there. Now, you did mention um, existing powers, and, and uh, Cathy, you, you talked about fuller use of existing powers. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think our, our view is that we strongly agree that island communities and authorities should have a, a stronger role in determining the use of their surrounding seas. Um, but I think our concern about the proposal in the bill is that the, this, the local licensing uh, system would add to the, the existing national licensing process which Marine Scotland operates. Uh, and I think, as Aidan said, this risks you know, putting an extra burden on developers and, and regulators and advise, statutory advisors like ourselves, as well as communities. Um, and it might be actually quite a limited opportunity to influence the outcomes in terms of, you know, you've, you've already got the kind of national system. What, what, what power does, does the local system actually have to really influence that? So I think our, um, our preference really would be to formally increase the, the influence of island authorities and island communities on the existing licensing process um, and, you know, introduce a, a much stronger requirement to work for, for national and local authorities to work closely together. And, and this can be done under the existing uh, regime. So we've got good examples. I think a, a colleague of mine was telling me about a case in Aberdeen Harbour uh, where Marine Scotland are the licensing authority, but they brought in the local authority, Transport Scotland in terms of the port, um, and, and other interests to make sure that the, the, the proposal was well, uh, you know, well put together right from the start. Um, the other thing that I've mentioned earlier that I think is relevant here is the new system of marine planning, which hasn't yet you know, been properly rolled out around Scotland's uh, coasts and islands, but the regional marine plans, as they become uh, developed, uh, which should be put together by a group of local stakeholders and with community input, um, these should set the strategic vision for your, your surrounding seas. And then the licensing decisions should really follow that plan in, in a plan-led way, as we do, you know, generally on land. Um, and, and also the provision of the Marine Scotland Act is that the local authority and the regional marine planning partnership would then be a statutory consultee on the marine licensing uh, decisions within that, that regional plan area. So that provision as well, um, once, it's, once we have those regional marine plans in place, gives quite a lot of power and influence to, to the local authorities and, and their local communities. But we just haven't, we're not quite there yet. Um, but I just think strongly that we, you know, we need to, um, rather than introduce perhaps uh, dual um, parallel licensing systems that may not be that well integrated, we need to think more about how we can get proper influence into the, into the national system, which is important to have a national system because it does provide that consistency and um, clear sort of steer for, for, for developers. Yeah, just to add another quick point there on the importance of regional marine planning. Uh, so that really uh, should provide the, pr the framework for individual project consenting. It allows it to be con things to be considered in a coordinated way, and it allows for kind of full consultation on the sort of vision for, for, for a, a local uh, area of sea, if you like. And uh, there's some good work happening on regional marine planning. Shetland is doing some really good stuff, but elsewhere things are a bit slower. So um, it would be really important uh, to get in, uh, get the planning system sorted out, uh, maybe even in advance of uh, the, the, the licenses system kind of being, be, being adapted so that we're kind of able to make decisions in that framework of what, what everything wants to look like with a wider vision. I'm going to come on, and Indira, I will ask you uh, how that would differ in practice from, from the provisions set out in the Orkney and Zetland Acts. But, but to maybe push a bit more, the, the, the perception is this is devolving. So, but you're suggesting, Cathy, this is actually supplementing or putting an addition. Yes, yeah. I mean, the policy memorandum makes it clear that this would sit in addition to the 
existing national marine licensing scheme in much the same way as works licenses in Shetland operate at the moment. Um, and I think, you know, in Shetland there has been a recognition that that process of having the works license, um, you know, ability, it, it has, has provided influence for the local authority and it does allow them to have a say in, in, that, in that national process. But uh, I don't think you necessarily need that parallel licensing process to achieve that. Um, it, I think it would be very useful, and we'd suggested this in our evidence, to actually do, uh, do, do some work to see what the, what the effects of the Shetland um, approach have been and what developers think of that and whether there are better ways to, to, to achieve the objectives of actually having local influence in the licensing process, which is really what, what we want to see. So, so if there is duplication, does the potential exist to lose the central element of it and retain the, the I, local I think divorce. that would be quite difficult as well in terms of a very, um, you know, we're still at quite an early stage in terms of, as we said, marine planning, uh, even the marine licensing system has, you know, not been in place for that long. We're still learning lessons. We've got very innovative development activity in our seas, very challenging development activity, particularly in relation to marine renewables. And I think it would be very hard uh, for individual local authorities and you know, regional planning authorities to deal with that uh, without some kind of national overview. So I think um, it's better to stick to the national system, but just make sure there is proper local influence into that system, at least for now, at least, at least until we, we get to a more mature stage. Aidan in. Stuart's got a question, and maybe I could come back to you in a minute. So, Aidan. Actually, just agree with Cathy there. I think that was very well uh, made. Yeah, that point is, is good. Okay. Stuart, do you want to come in, and then I'll come back to you, John? Uh, thanks, Convener. I just wanted, in the narrow instance of Shetland, where there are related powers uh, that fishing interests have, which are out with the scope of this, uh, that appear to operate very successfully. And that's my view. It may not be your view. Um, I just wonder how that relates to planning delegation because there is an interaction between local exploitation of natural resources and planning develop, and developments arising from planning. Uh, and I would come from a position that the more communities control in a sustainable way natural resources, and the need for that to interact with this, that, that would be good news. But you kind of are saying something that is different from that. So specifically in Shetland, from what knowledge you may have of the control of um, natural resources that is specifically available in Shetland but not elsewhere, do you think that gives us a model that we could implement elsewhere? Or is it something that is probable that might just be particular to island groups rather than more generally coastal groups? Uh, no, sorry, did you no. want to? Yeah. Um, okay. it, it, it shouldn't be specific to, to Shetland. Um, I mean, it, I think the provision there is, is use, use of a regulating order. Um, it's, it's not related to the licensing system. No. It's, it, it's separate from that. Um, I think, you know, we, we, we would certainly encourage that to be, you know, to be uh, maybe worked on by uh, inshore fisheries groups elsewhere um, to, 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 to um, you know, come up with sustainable ways of managing their, their, their local resource. And again, I'm sounding a bit like a broken record, but the links into then marine planning uh, to try to make sure that fisheries management is well coordinated with all the other activities that are going on in that, in that area of sea. Um, and for, you know, again, uh, local communities to have, have a say in all of that. Um, but that's not going to be addressed by any kind of licensing provision. And actually, I think, and again, RSPB mentioned this in, in their evidence, there's some confusion in the terms in the bill about the, the sort of the, the way that licensing, uh, you know, the, the, the activities that could be licensed under this bill are a bit different from, from the Marine Scotland Act. And so, for example, you know, placing of, of materials or pontoons and things like that, I don't think is covered by the wording of, of this bill. So there's, a, again, a bit of a, of a confusion, really, about how the two systems well, might, might, just, might sit together. Just briefly, then, and I would come from this position that the exploitation of the natural resources should be the paramount consideration. Are you suggesting it should be the secondary one that's secondary to planning? Uh, n not in any way saying it should be secondary. I'm just saying that, that um, I don't think uh, there's any suggestion that we would be bringing fisheries management under a formal marine licensing system. No, no. No, no. Um, but we need to make sure that the mechanisms that are in place for managing fisheries are well coordinated with, with other activities through, through planning. 
back with a supplementary, and I'll bring Aidan and Cathy in, and then we'll move on to the next one. If, if well, you well, like well Stuart in part has touched on it, and it is any potential deficiencies, because picking up on comments my colleague Rhoda made earlier on, the perception of suits in Edinburgh making decisions, um, you know, I, I get that we, everyone has to be part of our, I have wider obligations than beyond the immediate community, but this is the whole ethos of this bill is, we're told, is about pushing power down. I'm wondering, is, 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 so is, is, is marine development something that should be specifically mentioned in the plan? Any linkages with that? Because I, 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 certainly I wouldn't be supportive of everyone operating as an island in their own as regards all the, the protections that are already there. And finally, if I may just throw in Brexit <coughs> and, and any implications that you see from that, please. And then we'll move on to Jamie. Sorry. Yeah. So, 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 I think that point maybe highlights the um, the, the, the risks of, of, of things getting considered in isolation when actually they're they're interconnected. And I guess we saw one of the potentially big benefits of a, 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 an island's plan is being bringing those different sectors together a little bit. So, uh, so terrestrial planning, for instance, is considered separately from from marine planning, and then resource use is considered separately again. If we've got something which allows us to kind of think about those in a coordinated way. At a strategic level that could help uh, coordinate things and, and kind of set a bit of a vision for how we want to, to make things more sustainable both at sea and, and on land because there is no doubt there's, there's connection between things and the fisheries activity is, a, is, a, is perhaps, a, perhaps a good example. And I think that would also make it make things more robust if, if and when we do get into a situation where the framework that we've currently got from Europe uh, changes, uh, if, we're, if we're able to kind of um, have something in place uh, which kind of provides that strategic framework, that could be, could be quite helpful. Um, Cathy, do you want to come in and then I'll move to Jamie? I don't think I've really got anything to add to what Aidan said there. Thank you. Okay, Jamie, yours is the next question. Thank you, Convener, and good morning, panel. Um, I might just press a little bit further on some of the points that John was making, and for the benefit, perhaps, of the record. Can you clarify if you think uh, that the provisions for the creation of the new marine licences in this bill should be in the bill or not? Because I'm a little bit confused. I hear, probably for the first time in these evidence sessions, some, perhaps, some negativity towards the, the, the potential outcome of what this, or the implication of what this, this might, might cause. So do you think we should do under existing powers such as Community Power Act or the Marine Scotland Act, or is there a requirement to do it in this bill? So, uh, Cathy. I mean, I'm, I'm not an expert on, on how you would make the changes, but I, I do think that rather than um, the bill setting out proposals for a completely separate new um, licensing provision, Perhaps the bill could make amendments to the Marine Scotland Act to allow for that important influence from local communities and local authorities. Um, but obviously, you know, I'm not an expert on, on, on the best mechanism to, to achieve that. Um, and I, I do think, I, I, again, I'm not sure about timescales and things, but a, a reflection on uh, the lessons from the Shetland experience would, would be helpful to inform that as well. Aidan, do you want to say anything on that? Or? So, not, not really much to add to that. I think uh, uh, I think we're supportive of the, the principle of, uh, of uh, giving island uh, um, island communities the ability to, to influence uh, individual project consenting decisions. But yeah, it's just that concern about the additional level of, of work that might be might be required, and maybe seeing how we can be a bit clearer about how we, we link the, the the two systems together to make sure they're better connected, to avoid duplication, and make sure we can kind of have a bit of a, a, a kind of uh, as efficient a system as po as possible, I guess. Okay, so um, when you say you had nothing to add, are you in agreement that this, as it currently stands, the bill creates a new layer which is unnecessary and instead it should be beefing up existing regulations and licensing powers? Um, well, it's a, it's a slightly different thing, I think. So it is giving uh, a, a, a specific responsibility to uh, island communities, but that is in addition, I guess, to the national uh, consenting uh, regime which is there at the moment. And... Um, for a consultation body, whether that's a statutory consultation body or a non-statutory consultation body, it's just making sure that we can kind of have, have a one point of contact, if you like, uh, to, to make sure that those decisions can be made in a coordinated way without uh, an authority having to respond to the two different systems. Okay. Um, and, and how far do you think down the chain this empowerment should go? So, for example, uh, I believe as it currently stands, local authorities will apply to ministers for the, uh, the power to... Um, uh, to give licences to, to, to persons who apply for them. 
But some representation we've had, certainly at community levels, feel that there should be even further uh, the devolution of that. And I, I guess John Finney's point was that this bill is to empower islands more. Um, do you think the local authorities uh, is the right place for these new licensing powers to, to live, given that they do not currently hold that expertise or, or power? Um, and in practical terms, how could it work? Uh, how should local communities have a bigger say in the issuing of, of, of licences for, for the development purposes? I'm going to bring Aidan in, if I may, and then I'd like to take a question from Peter and, and then give Cathy a chance to come in and say, Aidan, if you'd like to start on that. So I, I, I guess we don't really have a view as to which level the, the power should sit, but the critical thing is that uh, the decision-making body, if you like, has access to uh, the specialist advice that's required and are adequately resourced to deal with that. Um, so uh, development decision-making can uh, be complicated and result in quite significant changes, particularly to the natural environment, but also to communities themselves as well. Um, and uh, yeah, having access to kind of particularly specialist advice will be is a, is a most important thing. Okay, Peter, do you want to come in? Yeah, thanks, uh, convener, and uh, good morning, folks. Uh, I mean, the bill allows local authorities to decide whether they want to take up this, these powers or not. So obviously there is a chance that some will and some won't, and this will you know, lead to inevitably to uh, some inconsistency and, and possibly some confusion as to what, you know, what, what rules and regulations there are out there. Given that, that that is the situation, do you feel that that, that, that is a correct decision to allow the, the, the authorities to decide or not? And uh, if you don't think it's th that freedom should be allowed, should there be more of a national licensing scheme so that we have consistency across the board in, as regards to these powers? Cathy, that's coming to you. <laughs> okay, well, I mean, I, mean, I think, to be, to be honest, we have the national system. Um, and uh, I, think, I think the devil is, is in how you make sure that uh, we, we get effective local influence. And coming back to um, the, the previous question there, um, it is about how you, uh, even, even in the, you know, if local authorities are having that influence into the, into the licensing decision process, how do you make sure that communities have a voice in that? Um, and I, you know, I don't want to pass the buck, but I think that's a question for local authorities to sort of really carefully consider how, how, they, how they achieve that. Uh, go back again to, to marine planning process where, um, you know, as I say, the, the, the marine planning partnerships, which could, should be very inclusive, um, would, would be a statutory consultee on licensing. Um, so they would have a say on, on those national licensing decisions. Um, but I think it is really about making sure that we have it end up with a process where not just the quite limited um, powers and provisions that are talk, talked about in terms of being devolved in this bill, but also, you know, decisions that are being taken by on, on a reserved basis um, about oil and gas or about, um, you know, defence type issues, that there is a, a, some sort of local input to those decisions as well. Mm. Um, so we need to make sure, I think, that, that um, whatever provision we, we, we end up with, um, it, it, it covers the broad range of, of issues that local communities will want to try to, to influence and not just quite a narrow, narrow range of things. Uh, I, but I take your point, there will be potentially some inconsistency and, and particularly in relation to, um, in the bill, it also talks about um, not just some authorities might take this up and, and some local authorities might not, but also then flexibility about which types of um, activities they might want to, to include and mm. which would be exempt. So again, another layer of potential um, difference and, and, and possible confusion. So I think there, there are quite a lot of issues here to be, to be unpacked. I, I'm, I'm actually going to ask, bring Fulton in here because his question sort of builds on that. So I'd like to bring him in and then I'm going to move to, to Richard. Thanks, Convener. Yeah, my question um, is, is what we've been focusing on over the, the last few bit. But I, I suppose I'd be uh, interested to, to think what, what both the panel members think about. Um, if you think that local people have enough say on what goes on in their waters or where, where, where does the balance lie? How much, if you, if you don't, how much more? I think we should have. Aidan, do you want to go with that to start with? Um, well, the, 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 the bill is proposed at the moment would certainly add some extra opportunities for local people to have a, have a say in, uh, in some development decisions which are, which are happening in local, local waters. So that's, that seems to be a, a kind of positive thing in terms of, in terms of local engagement. Um, 
I guess the, uh, the, the thing is, I would maybe come back to some of the comments I made earlier on, uh, particularly, which, which, and it's particularly important with uh, regard to Scotland's island communities where the natural environment is, is of particularly high value. It's of particularly high value to look to island communities, but it's of value to others beyond the island communities as well. So it's important to, um, uh, that, 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 that others beyond the islands are also able to have a, have a, have a little bit of a, a, a input into decision making as well. Okay. Kathy, sorry. Yeah, I, again, I don't have a lot to add to what Aidan said. I think, um, you know, we, we definitely think there is a, a, a need and a, and a real opportunity to, to increase the, the, the current uh, level of um, influence that, that local communities currently have um, to that sort of decision making on what happens on their island and on their, in their surrounding seas. So we do need to try to make sure that we, at the end of this process, we have a, a more effective way of, of doing that. But it's, it's all just about what, what is the best way to, to achieve that, what's the best way to make that happen, um, partly by making better use of existing provisions as well as anything that we might want to add. At, at the risk of putting you on the spot, are you able to give me a, a practical example of what how, how that might work, what you're saying in practice, how it might work either through you know, a, a local authority situation or a community council or, 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 or whatever example? I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm delighted if you'd like to give us an example, and I, and I will excuse you and say that I think it, it would be relevant to have it, but I'm very happy if you'd like to write the example and send it in if you don't have one that's particularly relevant that we could look at or, or discuss just now. So the options there. I quite like to reflect on it, actually. Um, you know, I, I, I probably would only be able to give you sort of more hypothetical examples. So it would be good to go and um, talk to colleagues about a good example to feed back to, if that's if that's okay. Okay, I appreciate that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That'd be fine. And if I just reiterate, if you could send that to the clerks, yeah. and then it can get round to all the people. <laughs> uh, the next question is is Richard. Um, yes. Uh, good morning, and thank you, Kavira. <coughs> Basically, you, you spoke earlier about what your organisations have been doing, but. Uh, I would like to press you more and ask what role do you think your organisation can play in the future marine development uh, in regards to this bill? Aidan, do you want to lead with that? Well, um, <coughs> so, I, so I guess uh, here today uh, uh, representing Scottish Environment Link and RSPB Scotland, so we're a non-statutory uh, body as far as uh, engaging in these processes goes. Um, I think the key area where we could uh, we can get involved is that we do have uh, across the link organisations some areas of expertise in this, and we represent our uh, in terms of specialist technical knowledge often, uh, but often we uh, represent uh, communities of interest. So uh, I mentioned a few times that the Scottish Islands of, are of particularly high natural heritage and cultural heritage importance, and uh, many members of uh, link organisations uh, are very. Uh, know, know the islands very well and and love the the, the, the uh, love the environment there and are, are keen to, uh, to to see it um, protected and enhanced and uh, keen to see local communities uh, rewarded for managing that so I think we can provide input in terms of uh, specialist um, advice technical advice sometimes but also in terms of the views of our membership and what they think about um, uh, the way the direction of uh, direction of travel uh, yeah, I, I think again our role in the in this in, in the marine licensing process is very much as a statutory advisor to to the regulators to to the decision makers. So, um, I, I guess thinking about how we might um, provide our role in a way that is 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 helpful to communities. Maybe I think we already do this to some extent, but you know, uh, in, in engaging in dialogue at the local level about the sort of dis, uh, you know developments decisions that that we're we're maybe advising on, um, particularly perhaps to share and try and explain the kind of issues that we're advising on. Um, so being, a, you know, perhaps a little bit um, more transparent or, or, or being trying to explain in, 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 a, in a way that is, is accessible to people why we might be making certain comments in relation to, to some types of uh, development activity. I think we're trying to do that, but maybe we could be doing, <coughs> doing that better. But our role very much is providing advice into the process rather than making the final decisions on, on licensing. I would actually see this bill as a bonanza for both your organisations because of the expertise that you have and, you know, you could actually sit down with people locally in order to bring forward your, you know, and, and develop. So from that, what would be your understanding of how the new licensing scheme may interact with current legislation? And do you foresee any issues? 
Aidan, do you want to go with that? Um, I, I would agree. There's a de definitely going to be additional opportunities to engage with, uh, with local folk, which is, which is great. Um, I think there will be uh, opportunities as well, perhaps, for, for maybe both our organisations to bring examples of the way uh, good practice has worked elsewhere as well to, to, to local communities. Um, and I, I, I think maybe we will be able to also kind of um, bring examples across the different sectors as well. So uh, we've talked a wee bit about the, the, the risk of duplication, but there's also potential, I think, to bring, bring across good practice as well across the different sectors, which, which I think would be, would be good. And um, yeah, I think the potential there is quite, is quite interesting. I, I think the last question uh, has to be, um, what would be the impact for mainland coastal regions or for islands whose local authorities chose not to take on these regulatory powers. At the end of the day, you know, you could be there, local communities, local community councils could, could tell me, but the local councils say, no, uh, we don't want to do this. What would, you, what would your view be? Should they be forced to do it, or should they, people say, well, if you don't want to do it, we'll do it? Um, Aidan, I'll, I'll let you come back with a short answer, and Cathy come back for a short answer, if I, if I may on that. Aidan, would you like to lead first? Well, I guess in practical terms, there's still a way of feeding into the marine licensing process as it is, albeit the decision was made at a national level rather than at a, a local level. So it wouldn't completely exclude local communities' ability to influence local decisions. It's just that those decisions are being made more, more, more nationally. So that's really the difference there would be. Um, but there, there, there will, will be some uh, resourcing implications for, uh, for local communities or local authorities associated with this if they were to take them up. So it might, that might be a factor in their decision-making process, but that would be something for them to, to, them to decide. Cathy, do you want... Yeah, I mean, to echo that, I think um, really that I think because of the sort of optionality of, the, of this uh, provision, um, that's why I think there might be a better way to achieve it by a more kind of formal um, linkage to, to that sort of influence of, of local authorities and communities into the, into the national process so that it's, it's more consistent and we don't rely on um, local authorities sort of having to take that decision about whether they want to go down that route or not. Thank you, Kindia. Okay, uh, and the final question is, is John's question. If, thank you. Um, the financial memorandum, I don't know if that's the one you went to first uh, when you were reading all this, but uh, anyway, the, I, I mean, really the costs that are laid out in the financial memorandum are mainly admin costs to do with many areas we haven't touched on today, like uh, ward boundaries and so on. I, I mean, just your overall view, are you comfortable with what's in the financial memorandum? Or are you concerned about anything in it? Cathy, would you like to go first um, on that? I have to confess I didn't spend a lot of time uh, <laughs> perusing the financial memorandum. I mean, I think our view is that, you know, a lot of this, as I said earlier, I think is good practice and there will be some cost attached to it, but it is about um, basically investing the time early on in the processes to, uh, to do a good consultation and to, and, <laughs> and to have that dialogue. Um, I, I think if you were going to make sure that... Uh, for example, island proofing decisions that are taken would then be amended, you know, on the on the influence of the, you know, what the, the island proofing um, has identified. Then there's probably potentially a cost to that. But again, it's a, it's a cost that should be should be found because it's yeah. I mean, for clarity, the financial memorandum would only talks about the admin side. It wouldn't build yeah, a new hospital okay. or so, anything like so, that. So, I mean, I, I don't have, I'm afraid, any no, basis right. to know whether that's accurate or not. But uh, certainly from our perspective, um, we would, you know, we, we would make sure that we have the budget to, to carry out the new duties. Aidan, do you want... Um, I, I had a quick look at the financial memorandum. I haven't ass assessed it in detail, but I thought it looked reasonable and realistic. Uh, that's, that's really as far as I could comment on it. That's fine. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. That comes to the end of that evidence session. Cathy Aidan, thank you very much for coming and thank you for giving evidence to the committee. I'm now briefly going to suspend uh, the meeting to allow a changeover of witnesses. Thank you.
Thank you. Uh, and now I'd like to move on to agenda item two, which, which is subordinate legislation. And this is the consideration of one affirmative instrument as detailed on the agenda. The Rural Committee will take evidence from the Cabinet Secretary for the Rural Economy and Connectivity. The motion to approve the affirmative instrument will be considered under item three. It would be reasonable for discussion also to cover any points regarding the related negative instrument to be considered at item four. Members should note that there have been no representations to the committee on, this, on these instruments. I'd like to welcome from the Scottish Government, first of all, Fergus Ewing, the Cabinet Secretary for the Rural Economy and Connectivity, Jen Willoughby, the Head of Agricultural Holdings Team, Fiona Buchanan, Senior Policy Advisor, Survise, advisor, not survivor, advisor. That's twice I've slipped with a tongue on agricultural matters. And Douglas Kerr, the solicitor. Could I invite the Cabinet Secretary to make a short opening statement? Uh, thank you, uh, Convener. The, the statement is of necessity technical and, and important, I think, to, to convey, and it is a, a bit long. Um, I am very pleased to be here today to support the consideration of the Committee of the Draft Land Reform Scotland Act 2016 regulations 2017. The regulations are made by Scottish ministers in accordance with powers conferred by section 127 1 and 2 of the Land Reform Scotland Act 2016. This forms part of a package with a negative instrument, the Agricultural Holdings Modern Limited Duration Tenancies and Consequential ETC Provisions Scotland Regulations 2017. There is also a commencement instrument which is subject to no parliamentary procedure. The Land Reform Scotland Act 2016 Commencement No. 6, Transitory and Saving Provisions Regulations 2017. Together, the three sets of regulations make provision for the introduction of modern limited duration tenancies. I'll briefly outline the context of, of content of the draft affirmative regulation and touch on the others also, if I may. Uh, modern limited duration tenancies, MLDTs, are introduced by the 2016 Act as an option for future agricultural tenancies. They replace the existing limited duration tenancy, LDT option set out in the Ag Holding Scotland Act 2003. LDTs already in existence before these regulations come into force will continue to exist, but there will be no new ones except in very limited and specific circumstances. The draft affirmative regulation makes a series of consequential modifications to other acts to ensure that where they currently refer to an LDT, references to MLDTs are inserted. This will ensure that MLDTs can follow smoothly from LDTs. LDTs are not simply being replaced in these acts because, as I said, those already in existence before these regulations come into force will continue to exist. The 2016 Act also introduced a further new type of tenancy, the repairing tenancy. This is a type of long-term tenancy which can be used where land is currently not in a state capable of being farmed and the tenant is required to improve the land to bring it up to standard. However, the relevant provisions of the 16 Act which provide for the creation of repairing tenancies are not yet in force. The draft affirmative regulation before you inserts references to repairing tenancies where it inserts references to MLDTs but the regulation also contains transitory provisions to ensure uh, that these references are to be ignored until the repairing tenancy provisions contained in the 2016 Act come into effect. We have drafted the regulations in this way to reduce further layers of amendments to various enactments in the future. So we are thinking about you. The regulations also contain other consequential modifications, supplementary, transitory and savings provisions in relation to the repeal of various sections of the 2003 Act by the 16 Act. Again, this is in order to facilitate transition from LDTs to MLDTs. It also ensures that MLDTs can use the existing rent review system as set out in the 2003 Act until the new rent review provisions in the 16 Act come into force. All of these provisions are to ensure that LDTs can be replaced by MLDTs in timely fashion and that the two forms of tenure can coexist until LDTs naturally come to an end or are converted, whichever may happen. The commencement and negative instruments also contain transitory and savings provisions 
and the negative instrument also has consequential modifications. Again, these are intended to ensure that references to MLDTs and repairing tenancies are inserted into relevant secondary legislation and that references to repairing tenancies are to be ignored until the relevant provisions come into effect. The negative instrument also sets out a definition of a new entrant to farming for the purposes of being eligible for a five-year break clause for an MLDT. Constructing that definition has been convener a lengthy process and has resulted in something that appears quite complex. I've written to you separately about that as I thought it would be helpful to do so and I hope that my letter has addressed some of the questions that you may have. I shall not therefore cover that ground again, it's in the letter, although we'll be happy to take questions on it. But I can assure you that my officials have worked closely with stakeholders to ensure these regulations meet their requirements, particularly in relation to that definition of a new entrant. You'll be aware that the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee have already considered these regulations. They've identified some issues in relation to the commencement and negative instruments. We will lay an amending instrument to address the issues that they have raised. The Equality Impact Assessment, the Business and Regulatory Impact Assessment and the Financial Memorandum prepared for the 69th remain valid for these regulations. I uh, commend the regulations to you and I'm very happy, uh, along with my officials, to take any questions that you may have. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Before we, before we go on to questions, uh, there are some of us who would like to declare some interest. I'd like to declare an interest that I'm a partner in a farm, farming partnership, and as part of that farm partnership, I have a new form of tenancy and a secure tenancy that forms part of that farm partnership. I also declare that I'm a member of the RICS, uh, who, who may have been consulted on these issues, but I have not spoken to them about it. Peter? Likewise, I would like to declare interest as being a, involved in a farm and a, a partnership in, in Aberdeenshire. Does anyone else want to? Stuart. Uh, and I am the joint owner of a very small agri registered agricultural holding, uh, which is uh, grass let to a neighbouring farmer. Um, uh, Cabinet Secretary, before we uh, actually move on to the questions, if I could uh, make an observation. Uh, thank you, first of all, for the letter that, that you sent us, which, as you say, is complicated. Some members of the committee found the flowchart at the back extremely helpful as a method of tracking it through. I would like to make an observation um, that some of the policy notes that I have read in, in relation to these instruments are extremely technical and extremely complicated, and I'm very thankful that I studied agricultural law to be able to understand them. There may be members on the committee that do not and have not studied agricultural law. And I think I would welcome in future, uh, and a matter which I will address at the conveners group, simpler policy notes that make it easier for committee members to understand what is trying to be achieved. I don't ask you to make comment on that, Cabinet Secretary. It is a comment that I, I would like to make. Uh, the first question I'd like to go to is Stuart, then I'd like to go to Peter. Uh, I think Stuart's got a few, and I see John's got a question, so Peter. Uh, uh, thank you, convener. I've, I've got a number of questions which probably are for, for, for officials, which uh, are just de determined to try and help me understand what the negative instrument that's before us uh, is trying to achieve. Now, the, the, the first one is an obvious one, just to get on the record. Uh, looking at uh, 3.2 and uh, 4.2, uh, I, I am reading that the starting assumption is that anybody with an MLDT is a new entrant until otherwise proved. That is, that is the correct position. Yeah. Right, thank you. <coughs> that, 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 that's clear. I just wanted to be, be certain uh, uh, about, uh, about that one. Now, um, they're a new entrant uh, subject to other things we'll come to uh, for the purposes of an MLDT. Does that influence or interact with the definition of a new entrant uh, for purposes of SRDP or otherwise? In other words, can someone be a new entrant in one but not in the other, or do they of necessity have to be a new entrant in both domains? Um, I think technically you can be a new entrant for one and not the other. This is purely for the purposes of um, MLDTs and whether you've got a new entrant, um, whether you've got a break clause in your lease. Yeah, that, 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 that was my conclusion, but I wanted to hear it said uh, on, on, on the record, uh, because obviously 
for grant purposes, you probably want to be a new entrant, um, but uh, in this area, you may not want to be a new entrant. Now, uh, just to be clear, um, the five-year break can only be put in if you're a new entrant and both the leasor and the leasee agree to it. That's the only circumstances in which the five-year break can be put in. Yes, that's right. Right, okay, that's fine. Now, uh, looking at uh, the, the, the definitions and first looking at uh, section three in the, the order, uh, which has various provisions that mean that people are considered not to be a new entrant. And just looking at one particular omission I don't see there that I might have expected to see there, uh, people who are engaged in contract farming but have never had a tenancy, never owned or controlled uh, a tenancy. Is it the policy intention that uh, con having spent even 20 years as a contract farmer leaves you for the purposes of an MLDT as a new entrant? Uh, that's correct, yes. That's what our stakeholders asked us uh, right. to be. So, so, that's, so I'm correct in reading that. So that's the, that's the policy decision that was agreed between the consulte consultees. Um, that, 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 that's fine. Um, looking at, at some of the other drafting, and I'm moving to um, 3.5c, um, do persons who between them hold or control directly or indirectly more than 50% of the voting rights in T, what does indirectly mean? Um, I think it's designed to cover situations where... Um, they might hold it through another legal person, for instance, or um, they don't, the, the right isn't in their name specifically, but they still have an ability to exercise that. You're, you're going to have to explain that a bit more for yeah. me. I don't, I don't know about Stuart. I, I didn't too. understand that. Pardon? Sorry, I, I, I think it would be you would have a, what you call me, class as a front man. Someone, someone in front of you. Douglas, do you want to, do you want to explain what Yes, what could, I, um, could I perhaps, before you do, yeah. because it might help to link it to this, if I go to five, there is another phrase which is similar, mm -hmm. dominant influence, you know, which is of a, of a similar character, and I'd really like to know what that's going to mean, I think this or is who will decide what it means. Yeah, this is designed to, um, we were trying to kind of capture the range of relationships a person might have if they are sitting behind um, a legal person and they uh, to explain what control might be and we were thinking that there might be situations where they can in fact be the person directing the will of this organization and because we weren't looking so much at the who's got rights to the capital or the um, revenues from it but who can control the decisions and so we we're trying to kind of make it as expansive as possible so indirectly is to cover situations where they might exercise that right through someone else. For instance, they might hold the right in a legal person who has the right to vote in that company or in dominant influences if they can um, force their will, essentially. So it's to say that they have got more influence than others. Right. And, and to be clear, what I'm taking from this is this is about operational decisions related to how farming is conducted and quite independent of ownership and, uh, and financial benefit from farming. Yeah, that was a policy intention. Right. So, sorry, can, sorry, can I just push a little bit on that? I mean, I'm, personally, I'm not quite sure how you define indirectly. Well, so, so, I mean, from a son, just say you have a son and a father. Mm. The father may directly control the son. The son will deny it. So it, it legally, if you take that to court... You, you won't be able to prove it because it will just be it will be a situation that's not proved. So, as far as the law is concerned, I struggle to see how, by putting it in here, you are achieving anything that that can be enforced. Um, I think I think the intention behind indirectly was to cover situations where they had they did hold it. So, for instance, through a legal person um, for the father-son relationship, that it might be caught by the dominant influence, but. I think we were trying to strike a balance generally about making the provisions work, uh, but recognising that there might be situations where the, the law just can't capture the specific situations of that, that circumstance. 
So, sorry, can I just push one more time on that? So you would, you would be happy to go to court and prosecute on the basis that you could prove that there was indirect control by another member? You would be happy to argue that case. Not prosecute, sorry, that's the wrong word. But you would be happy to argue that, that case. Um, I, well, I think our position is that it's, this is setting out um, how you determine that. But in the first instance, it's not, it's not for the Scottish Government to determine, because it's not for the parties to look at this themselves. Um, so I don't think we would be pushing okay. that. Over the time. Sorry, Stuart. Um, um, I think you say that as far as I understand it, and my officials are correct me if I'm wrong here, there's no question of prosecution of crimes here. No, no, this no, is a matter no, of no. civil law, pri private law between individuals and regulating proposed facilities to really encourage leasing to new entrants. That's where we're starting from here, and the work was, with stakeholders was designed to, to achieve that policy objective. But it's not, I mean, I, I, I'm not meaning to be critical, I'm just saying it's nothing to do with criminal laws, no, I understand. But, but, but we're looking at circumstances here where the leaseor and the leasee, because they both have to agree that there is a breakpoint, they both presumably want a five-year breakpoint in the MLDT, this is a means by which saying that the leasee is indirectly <coughs> controlled or influenced by someone else, that they are not entitled to that, to write that into the MLDT. That is the bottom line of what this is intended to mean. <coughs> so it presumably, in policy terms, is something that's not expected to happen terribly often, where both the leaseor and the leasee want the MLDT to have the five-year break, but there is indirect, it considered there's indirect control. That, that will be comparatively rare in policy terms. Is that a fair comment? Um, yeah, I would expect so. I would expect right. that, yeah. So I am feeding you the line <laughs> in, in, the, in, in the hope that you will, you will say. And, but, but equally, can I just sure be clear whether dominant influence, uh, which is in five, essentially is the same, the same thing expressed with different words? Um, it's, uh, that's trying to get to the situation where um, the party can control the, they can uh, trying to express their will and they, their will can determine the operations of the company where they might not have um, a specific right and that's the kind of capture situation where the legal person might not be in the, the kind of structure that we normally think of. As, I, I think you know, it would be helpful if you can um, right. give us a, an example okay. because I, I, having been involved with companies in all sorts of ways, I sort of get it, but I'm not sure yeah. I do. So I'm a bit like Edward, who's got some legal training. I've yeah. got experience, and I still don't quite get okay. real well, yeah. circumstance. Would the committee, um, what might be useful is if we can write the committee separate on this point to explain our thinking behind it? Well, the, 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 the committee's kind of in a position of having to report to Parliament today, um, and we're with, and, and I think if I'm correct, convener, the, the, the date at which this comes into operation is uh, only four weeks away. Um, um, no, you're right. I mean, we have, to, we have to make a decision on it today, if, if the Cabinet Secretary presses it. Uh, well, this is negative, remember? Uh, negative, sorry, yes. Sorry. So we do have to make it. You, you're right, Stuart, thank you. <coughs> sorry, two seconds. Douglas, you are, are you able to give us a... Yeah, um, a so I'll just remember the colleague. Um, we think one for instance might be, for instance, um, the, if the son has the right in the legal person and the father is exerting the will, the example you gave earlier on, um, that might be that the father is in practice and in fact exercising influence over the son who is, has the interest in the legal person. And, and indeed, so really the, the, the use of the phrase dominant interest, uh, influence in one part and indirectly essentially comes down to basically the same thing. Um, yeah. Right, okay. So, uh, John, is it on this particular point or is it as... It is the point I was going to raise, but I think it is actually relevant to this point, if I, if I may. Okay, then, John, um, can I bring John in and then come back to you, and, and then I've got Peter it, as well. And it was, it was a comment about process, and, and namely that... Um, I uh, understand that this legislation has its genesis with the Land Reform Act and there was a formal consultation in relation to that. Um, 
so, so in respect to the documents we've got, we're told that there's informal con con uh, consultation with stakeholders will continue taking place during the implementation process. And it was just to understand who's involved in that and whether maybe some of the issues that, that Mr Stevenson legitimately raises have been raised by any of the stakeholders. Um, Cabinet Secretary, do you want to answer that or, or um, is it... Is it well, uh, well I'll, I'll start off by answering it in general, you know, who, were, who were involved. It's a, it's a pertinent question. And the Scottish Government officials work closely with stakeholders and references made to NFUS, SLE, STFA, RICS and S SAVA um, to identify the definition that would be most appropriate of new entrants, all for the purposes of this measure, which is designed if, if you if you like, to remove perceived barriers to landlords granting leases to new entrants. And as I understand it, the, you know, the big picture here, convener, is that uh, uh, there would be some concern in landlords that some new entrants may not sort of stay the course and may not exhibit good husbandry, which I think is the phrase that is used and appears in the legislation. And that if that happened, for whatever reason, not ascribing blame to anyone, but this, this happens, then the landlord might be left with a very long lease and a tenant that uh, was not able really to manage to farm, exhibiting good husbandry. And that would be a problem for both of them because the landlord would have a tenant that's not really doing what it's supposed to do or able to or, or can do. And the tenant would be left with an obligation to pay the rent for, for a number of years after perhaps a point when it would be sensible to bring things to a close. So I think that in essence is, is the kind of practical problem the, the stakeholders and officials um, tended to pursue. But uh, to protect myself, I've just asked officials to see if I've got that right or not. Since I'm, um, it, it, but I think that's, that's the, the kind of the causa causans behind the, the main purpose of this. Is that right, uh, yeah, Jane? that's correct. Uh, everything else falls to that. And really, the, the, the perfectly legitimate focus on these technical questions uh, is, to avoid and, is to create anti-avoidance provisions which one might not really expect to occur in the, in the majority of cases. Uh, but, you know, the courts are there to interpret legislation. I mean, if after further discussion with stakeholders, I think this was the second implication, second point Mr Finney rightly raises, uh, there are any further questions to be asked, then, you know, we are, we are intending to bring forward a, 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 an amendment to deal with the DPLR issues. It would not be impossible also to bring forward an amendment if, if it subsequently emerges that there is any technical defect in relation to the anti-avoidance um, provisions. That would be perfectly possible to do, and I would be willing, of course, to, to do it should that arise, but uh, I'm, not, I'm not convinced that that's the case at the moment, but, but that's a matter for the committee to uh, pine can, on. Sorry, can, as John asked the question, I'll let him come back and then come to you, Stuart. If I'm no, no, that's helpful. Thank you very much. Okay, Stuart, um, uh, I'm trying to avoid causes belli, of course. But uh, I've just got two further ones, both of which I think are quite straightforward. Um, the, the one is in relation to uh, LLPs, where despite, I think, some efforts that the UK government's making on the subject, there's still, in a number of cases, some un lack of clarity about ultimate control and ownership that, where LLP is involved. What consideration has been given to, to that in this here? Now, re remembering that this is only about the ability to put a breakpoint in, it's not about the fundamentals of something I welcome, which is the MLDT. Yeah, Sorry, Cabinet Secretary, are you yeah, happy for you? Yeah, Thank you. Um, and with regard to LLPs, um, you'll be aware that there have been recent changes to yeah. the law made across the EU to start to tackle those particular issues and the Scottish Government officials are working with colleagues to explore opportunities to um, ensure that the industry is fully aware of their legal obligations in relation to LLPs, particularly for the agricultural sector because um, we're working quite closely with Companies House and Companies House have contacted everybody with an LLP within the agricultural sector and at asked them to confirm their details, which has resulted in um, some individuals coming back and saying LLPs for them have ended. And we are in regular correspondence with them. We're happy to share that with the committee as we progress in that area. There are um, 504, I think, I'll have to confirm that in writing, um, 
Scottish limited partnerships that are agricultural ones. However, um, it may be that the paperwork isn't in place in relation to the LLPs, and that's what Companies House are exploring at present for those individuals in the agricultural tenancies. I, I, I think that's very helpful and quite reassuring. Uh, finally, my final point, there may be others. Um, in section 5A2, it, it, it refers to equivalent persons. Um, one of the categories of equivalent persons I thought that might apply to would be proxies who, do, who might be, for the purposes of a meeting only, uh, be exercising deliberative control over decisions uh, while not otherwise having any interest uh, through ownership or influence. Is that the sort of thing that's meant by equivalent persons or is there more to it than that? Um, I think equivalent person was to capture the fact that not all legal persons will have um, shareholders and sh uh, share, uh, share capital, so it's to... So you think, just to yeah. cut across you slightly there, so you're thinking of things like partnerships? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank um, you, Okay. Is there anyone else? Uh, Pete, sorry, Peter. Yeah, thank you, convener. Um, you've just been having some very detailed questioning from Mr. Stevenson. My question is a much broader question, but nevertheless a very important question. And in your letter, Cabinet Secretary, you, you say attracting new entrants into agriculture has been identified as one of the most serious is issues affecting the industry. I couldn't agree more. And I expect that you feel that this MLDT will, will do, go some way to addressing that problem. But to be honest, I hate my doubts, and I don't think this will make much, much difference whatsoever, because the real problem, the real problem with the, with the tenant sector in Scotland is landlords have, have lost the confidence in letting land on a long-term basis, <laughs> simply because various SNP ministers over the years have continually raised the issue of a, an absolute right to buy. Now, we've seen thousands of acres lost to the tenant sector this year alone. My question is this, does, do, do you, Cab Secondary, agree with me that the real problem here is the absolute right to buy is still floating around there in the, in the background? Uh, sorry, can, can, I'm going to take the question and I'm going to let the Cabinet Secretary answer it. Uh, okay, Richard, can Quite I... Can I, can, I, I, can don't, I, see, I just, don't see the on, relevance Rich, of Rich. that question to what we're discussing just now. No, I do. No, I do. I, th I think the, the, the link is that, uh, is that there's trying to identify the way to increase tenanted land, which is the aim of the M M MLDT. And Peter's trying to provide a link. I, ta I take the point you made. I'd like to let Peter finish the question, the Cabinet Secretary to take it, and then Richard, I believe you have a, a further question. Yes. Thank you. So, Peter, would you like to finish your question well, briefly? Thank, thank you. I, I, I felt I did make the link, and, and it's an important link. And I would like the Cabinet Secretary to respond. And if he would, if he would unequivocally take off the table the absolute right to buy, then I think he would do far more for the tenanted sector than anything else that we are discussing today. Um, can I, Cabinet Secretary, would you like to answer, answer that question? Uh, well, uh, what I would say is that we are focusing today on specific statutory instruments, and I would address <coughs> my remarks to that statutory instrument. Of course, there is a much wider debate, but, uh, but I think I have, uh, I think I'm able to say that I've worked with all stakeholders, including SLE, in numerous meetings and engagements, uh, informal and formal, uh, to indicate that we are determined to get the best possible use of land in Scotland to encourage landowners and tenants to work together. And quite frankly, I mean, this process has resulted from that practical working. So I'm not here to score political points here, but to address relevant questions in relation to these statutory instruments. And that's, uh, of course, what I, what I shall do. Uh, but I'm working positively with uh, landlords and tenants to encourage them to use the vehicles, uh, which after all, they negotiated themselves, both prior to the 2003 Act and in respect of today's stat uh, statutory instruments. These are matters that we have discussed with landlords representatives as well as tenants representatives and brought it forward after that process in the hope that these, uh, these measures will be used. And I would encourage them to be used so that uh, we can see more new entrants coming in to farming. I'm not saying that these instruments themselves will do everything, but of course we have uh, 
fairly solid financial support measures uh, for both young farmers and new entrants, uh, and that is the principal policy object. Policy means that we seek to bring in new people and younger people to farming. No comment, uh, no comment on absolute right to buy whatsoever, Cabinet Secretary. Um, Peter, I think, I think that, 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 that is strange, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to stop that there, and I'm going to move to Richard Lyle's question on, on these statutory instruments. Please. Yeah, well, you know, at the end of the day, I, I read this letter also, and I don't see the concerns that people have. Um, it says, and can, can you confirm, stakeholders have not raised any concerns with us about this process, and can I remind, remind people on this committee uh, we're not doomed, as Mr Chapman would suggest. And can I also remember that Right to Buy was brought in, I think, for housing by the Tories about 30-odd years ago. So uh, it's not the first time that Right to Buy has been used. Richard, Richard, Richard I, I got my point then. You, you, you've made your point, and, and I think you strayed as far as you accused another member of the committee of straying. So I'm going to park it there. Are there any other, are there any other questions the committee would like to ask? Because I would like to ask one to sum up uh, my concerns. Any other? Sorry, Jamie. Uh, the panel will be pleased to know I'm not going to go into, into great detail the wording of the SSIs. Um, just on the point of um, that the, uh, addressing the issue of, of uh, long-term leases and landlords' concerns over uh, that, it is, is, in layman's terms, is it that the definition of a new entrant is changing in this or is it the introduction of the five-year break clause? I was a bit unclear as to what was new in this compared to what was happening in the 2003 <laughs> Uh, act. Um, it's the introduction of the five-year break clause, which is new, and the definition of a new entrant applies to that five-year break clause only. So it is a new definition, but only for the purposes of MLDTs. But the, the thing that's new about MLDTs is the introduction of the five-year break clause. Thank you. Okay. Does anyone else have any questions? I have one further question. Is, is in relation to the points that uh, were brought up about from Stuart regarding equivalent person uh, dominant uh, control <coughs> and indirect control, it seems to me that you're trying to sweep up a variety of, uh, of interests that, that could uh, conflict with, with the aims of the bill. It may be that those actual definitions don't necessarily work, and it would be nice to have an assurance from the Cabinet Secretary that if the aims are not achieved by those sweeping up phrases, that he will look at further legislation to, to sweep them up as he's intended to do in the legislation? Um, well, if, of course, if, if there are, and this applies to the generality of uh, subordinate legislation, any manifest flaws that are brought to our attention by anyone, then of course we will study them, and if, it is, if persuaded that there is indeed a flaw in the law, we will take steps to correct it. Of course, of course we will be happy to give that assurance. Okay, thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, could I ask you if, you if there are any closing remarks you'd like to make at this stage that I would ask you to, to make them brief if possible, Cabinet Secretary? I would commend these measures. Thank you. Uh, we're going to now move on to agenda item three, which is the formal consider of, consideration of motion S5M07896 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary asking the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee to recommend that the Land Reform Scotland Act 2016 Supplementary Consequential Transistory and Saving Provisions Regulations 2017 be approved. Can I ask Cabinet Secretary for you to move the motion uh, as does described above uh, formally, please? Formally moved. Are there any further comments that the committee members would like to make? No. So the question is that motion S5M07896 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. That is agreed, and that concludes consideration of agenda item three. Uh, can I suspend the meeting briefly to allow witnesses to leave the room and thank the Cabinet Secretary and his team for attending the meeting today? Thank you.
and I'm going to go. We now move on to agenda item four, subordinate legislation. Agenda item four is the consideration of a negative instrument as detailed on the agenda. Members should note that no motions to annul have been received and there have been no representations to the committee on this instrument. Are there any comments from members regarding this instrument? Stuart. Um, I, I would just welcome the, the approach that's been taken. I think these technical things are things we should always challenge because the 2003 Act where every politician in the Parliament agreed on that ended up being to some limited degree flawed by some technical issues. So I, I welcome the fact that the Cabinet Secretary has said in relation to what the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee have said, they're looking at bringing another instrument to, forward to address their concerns uh, and uh, what I heard the Cabinet Secretary say that he would in that context look at anything we've said. I for my part have not identified any changes that I would encourage him to make and I thought it was a useful important uh, point to flush that out from his officials. John. I, I think in any switch between two bits of legislation, I think it's the transitional arrangements are, are absolutely key. What I took reassurance from was a couple of things. Namely, I've had no representations in respect of issues made, and there's ongoing engagement from the, 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 the people who should be engaged with on this issue. So yeah, I would leave my uh, comments. Does any other member of the committee wish to make comment? Um, so is it... Is the committee agreed that it does not wish to make any recommendations apart from the fact that we welcome uh, the uh, discussion of this in, uh, instrument? Is, is that what we're agreeing? Yes. Okay, that's agreed. Therefore, I'd like to move on to agenda item five, subordinate legislation again, which is the consideration of a negative instrument as detailed on the agenda. Members should note that no motions to annul have been received and there have been no representation to the committee on this instrument. Does anyone on the committee wish to make any comment on this instrument? Is the committee therefore agreed that it does not wish to make any recommendation in relation to this, this instrument? That is agreed. And that concludes today's business. November, where we'll be taking evidence with the Minister of Transport on the Islands Bill, and we'll also have an evidence session on the rail services with Scott Rail Alliance. Thank you for your attendance. And that's the meeting closed.